The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, Romans chapter 9 and verse 4. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, Power, Spiritual and Temporal. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We thank thee for thy grace and faithfulness, for the way thou dost deal with us as with children. Thou art not harsh, but thou art the God of love, and thou dost treat us as parents treat children when they're learning to walk. Day by day thou dost cover us with thy blessings. Wilt thou use the work of this hour to reach the hearts of thy people? Hear us, we pray thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Now in our study of the ninth chapter of Romans, we have reached the great section of scripture where God defines the likenesses and differences between his people Israel and the church of the present age. Having seen in our last study that the church has all its blessings through the promises which God made to Abraham, we now see that there is a great difference between the two because of the covenant made by God with David and which has nothing to do with the believers of this age. At this point, there comes the thorny question of the dispensations. There are some people who have emphasized the differences between Israel and the church to the point where they deny that there is any resemblance or correspondence between the two. They are well-meaning people, often very fundamental on the great doctrines of the faith, not realizing that the extremity of their position is as wrong as any other extreme. This extreme has caused some people to label their doctrines as completely erroneous and has brought a stigma on the word dispensation, and these people have been named dispensationalists. For many years I have avoided the term and have constantly stated that I am not a dispensationalist, as indeed I am not in the sense in which the term is applied with opprobrium. Let us recognize, however, that every Christian is a dispensationalist in some sense. If you do not offer blood sacrifices for the cleansing of sin, you are a dispensationalist, as since you recognize a difference between the age that preceded Christ and the age that has followed Christ. If you keep Sunday instead of Saturday, as a Christian should, you are a dispensationalist. It would be possible to extend the list of practices which now differ from before the time of Christ and since the time of Christ, and we will have occasion to return to this phase of the subject. But if you go so far as to say that the age in which we live is one in which there should be no water baptism of any kind, then you are a dispensationalist in the bad sense. And if you go so far as to say that there is no union between Israel and the church, then you are a dispensationalist in the wrong sense. In our last study, I set forth the great fact drawn from many parts of the scripture to show that Israel and the church share the same promises for the future, both in the resurrection of the righteous at the time of the second coming of Christ and in all the glories that shall follow throughout eternity. The differences between the two bodies now occupy our attention. First, however, we must study this word that is used by God and which is sometimes translated in our scriptures as dispensation. The Greek word is oikonomia, and our English word economy comes directly from it. This word in turn comes from the common noun oikos, meaning house or home, in combination with the common noun nomos, meaning law. To the ear of the Greek, the combined form would have sounded like house law, though the details of its origin probably sank quickly out of mind, even as people use our word holiday, without any thought of its original meaning, holy day. The early meaning of this Greek word referred to the way a house was run, and the person that managed the house was called by the masculine form of the word. In the Bible, the word is used three times with the translation stewardship, and four times it is translated dispensation. It is found three times in the parable of the foresighted thief, often called the parable of the unjust steward, who was called upon to render an account of his stewardship. The New Revised Standard Version follows the King James Version in this parable and uses the word stewardship three times. When we come to the passages where the word is translated dispensation, it's quite otherwise. 
To the Corinthians, Paul wrote of the fact that a dispensation of the gospel was committed to him. The revision reads, I am entrusted with a commission. To the Ephesians, the Spirit speaks of God's future plans and announces that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, God purposes to gather together in one all things in Christ. The revision simplifies this greatly, saying, according to God's purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him. Further, in this same epistle, Paul reminds the church of the dispensation of grace that was given to him for them. The revision reads, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. Now, finally, in the epistle to the Colossians, Paul states that his ministry was according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, while the revision states that this ministry was according to the divine office, which was given to me for you. Now, throughout the past generations, many theologians have used the word dispensation to describe the difference between the manner of doing things before the time of Christ and the different manner of doing things since the time of Christ. Thus, we find throughout all the history of theological writing that the term is commonly used for this major difference by such noted theologians as Hodge and Warfield of Princeton, by the Baptist Strong, and by the Lutheran Pieper, and many others. It remained for the 19th century to find a more extended use of the word, and it became applied to a system setting forth that there are seven dispensations, supposedly, in God's dealings with man, from the period of innocence in the Garden of Eden through the final millennial kingdom when Christ comes to reign on earth. This system has been set forth in much detail through the notes in the reference Bible edited by Dr. Schofield, commonly called the Schofield Bible. The animosity which has been aroused against this volume is very curious and reveals many prejudices. I myself believe that much of this animosity could have been avoided if there had been a more careful setting forth of the truths which I stated in the last of these studies, showing that all of the blessings which are ours in the age in which we live grew out of the promises made to Abraham and that there is a spiritual continuity between Israel and the church which cannot be gainsaid. In one of my books, Teaching the Word of Truth, I have attempted to show that there are indeed many tests to which mankind has been submitted, but have noted that in all ages, salvation has come to all men in the same manner, namely, through sovereign grace. Now, the purposes of these various tests are to reveal that there is no good in man that could ever satisfy God, and that man is shut up to the sovereign grace of God for any and every blessing. The differences between the arrangements made by God for testing men from Moses to Christ and those which are in force at the present time are most important. In order to show those differences, it's necessary to show the great difference between Israel and the church in their earthly relationships. These differences may be set forth under the eight heads which are before us in the early verses of Romans 9. First, to the children of Israel was given what is called the adoption. We turn back to the book of Exodus, and we find that Moses was sent to the court of the greatest nation on earth with a divine commission concerning the children of Abraham, which were then in slavery in Egypt. You shall say to Pharaoh, God said to Moses, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. Now this adoption is not the same as that which we have studied in the eighth chapter of this epistle. In our case, the adoption is that of individuals who have been begotten from the dead through the work of the Holy Spirit on the grounds of Christ's redemptive death. In the case of Israel, the adoption is a national one. The entire nation was adopted as a nation. Some individuals were also adopted spiritually as the children of God. This distinction is of great importance, for if it is not recognized, many false applications of Scripture will be made. Throughout the Old Testament, there is a stream of promises given to this people as a nation, promises that set that nation off from all the peoples of the earth for all time. Two or three will suffice. We read in Deuteronomy 33, Happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, 
the shield of your help and the sword of your triumph. Your enemies shall come fawning to you and you shall tread upon their high places. This word was spoken by Moses just before his death. And as the nation was about to enter into the land which the Lord had chosen and sworn to give to this people. One of the greatest confirming prophecies was written to Jeremiah. It contains themes of tenderness and pathos, themes of stern warning and judgment, and themes of promise and triumph. We read in Jeremiah, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Again, I will build you and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. I will lead them back. I will make them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, says the Lord, then shall the descendants of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below can be explored, then I will cast off all the descendants of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. Now surely here are promises which belong to Israel alone. There is no other nation under heaven who can pretend to such a position with the Lord. When we understand this, we can understand why anti-Semitism has come into being in the world. Because the Lord has chosen Israel as a nation, the power of Satan has been arrayed against this people from the beginning. No such power is given to the church. Just here we can understand one of the great trends of history and one of the great errors in the thinking of the church of the Middle Ages, and one of the reasons why we must be so stalwart against any union of church and state. There had been great power vested in the Roman Empire. This power hung over the world and had penetrated into the thinking of men in all the civilized nations. They couldn't conceive of life and government without the Roman Empire. Suddenly, the whole fabric of government crumbled. The forces of disruption which had been working for so long within the empire weakened it to the point that when the inrushing pagan tribes breathed upon it, it fell apart. Immediately there was a scramble for political power. Every local force lifted itself to claim as much authority as possible. The strongest men in each district took the power and began to rule. In one place it was a duke, in another it was a count, and sadly enough, in another place, it was a bishop. Men in high church positions fell before the terrible temptation of greed for power and originated the idea that the church was to reign on earth as a temporal power. This sin explains much of the history of the Middle Ages and the struggles between church and state which have marred the character of Christendom for the past 1500 years. For the church was put into this earth to be a witness against the world and a testimony to individuals that God was saving men through free grace. The church, like the dog in Aesop's fable, who dropped a real bone to grasp at its reflection in the water, lost sight of the wonderful truth it held in its grasp and seeing its spiritual power distorted in a reflection to resemble spiritual power, dropped the true power which was its inner genius and grasped at the bare bones of temporal power. The result was that the spiritual power was lost and the church found itself in the arena wrestling with gladiators of the flesh for a power that could never satisfy the inwardness of those who were called to high and heavenly things. As spiritual power has been given away for temporal power, and our position of hatred in the midst of the world has given place to a sort of popularity that was uncalled for in those who follow Christ. Now it is precisely because those who sought for temporal power wished to bolster their pretensions from scripture that there was created 
the whole monstrous theology of interpreting the earthly promises which belonged and which still belong to the Jews as though they could be applied to the church. It is impossible to study the Bible honestly and come up with any justification for the great machine-like organizations which pass for churches today. Now do not misunderstand. There must be some organization, for the Lord has told us that all things must be done decently and in order. He himself chose twelve apostles and left the church on earth in charge of these men with the Holy Spirit as the true vicar of Christ, governing within the hearts of men and bringing to pass the counsels of the Father's will. Soon as the church grew, it was necessary to choose deacons who took charge of the charitable works of the church. These men were chosen because they were filled with the Holy Spirit and would think of the interests of the needy before they would think of their own interests. And finally, younger men were chosen, Timothy is the outstanding example, to proceed with the organization of the church. This was to be on the simple basis of elders in every church who were to take the oversight of the affairs in the local congregation. From this has spread the super organizations and the abuses which are constantly to be corrected by those who wish to be led of the Holy Spirit. Now all this is sufficient to show that the church is in no wise an earthly kingdom with earthly power and authority. The government of Israel is not to be established within the church, for the government of Israel was a temporal power with promises specially given to David in that covenant. And it shall again be a temporal power, even as the abundant prophecies show. For the Lord Jesus shall come again and sit upon the throne of his father David, and of the increase of his government there shall be no end. The main distinction between the spiritual members of national Israel and the church which came into being on the day of Pentecost is that the men in the Old Testament times were not indwelt by the Holy Spirit, while he, the third member of the Godhead, comes to dwell within the hearts of all who have trusted in Christ since the time of the birthday of the church. When Christ spoke to his disciples in the upper room, the night before the crucifixion, he promised them that he would send the Holy Spirit to them. His words are these, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The revision speaks of him as another counselor. The Greek word paraklete means someone who is called alongside to guide and direct. It is by his presence that Christ fulfilled his promise that he would come to dwell in our hearts by faith. For just as he could say, he who has seen me has seen the Father, could well have said, he in whom the Holy Spirit is living is being lived in by myself. It is because of this immeasurable spiritual superiority which we have while living here on earth that the Lord said that we have a spiritual superiority over the saints of the Old Testament. It should be noted in passing that this present superiority gives us an incalculably greater responsibility. You are more responsible to God than Abraham or Moses or David because you live since the time of Christ. The statement of this position was made by Christ at the time John the Baptist was in prison and sent his disciples to question Christ. After the difficulties in the mind of John had been cleared up, Christ spoke in glowing terms of this true man of God, saying that of all those who had been born of woman, there had not risen a greater than John the Baptist. So this put John on a par with Abraham, Moses, Elijah, and the other great men of God who had preceded Christ. And after this came the astonishing words of our Lord, that the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. Now in the context, it must be clearly understood that the reference to the kingdom is a reference to its spiritual aspect today in the church, as the truth of God is spread from heart to heart by the work of the Holy Spirit. It shows us 
that the simplest believer in Christ, a man who may have strayed into a rescue mission with all the marks of sin on his body, soul, and spirit, and in a transforming moment of the new birth, has come to know the incoming of the Holy Spirit in the divine life, that such a man has advantages during this lifetime that are greater than the advantages which were those of Abraham and John the Baptist. How important for us to realize the solemnity of these teachings. All believers of whatever time are saved by the work of the Holy Spirit, applying the redemption made by Christ to our need. All such believers are fellow heirs of the eternal promises. But we who live today are the temples of the Holy Spirit, called upon to carry the love of Christ to those round about us, to display that love in every word and in every gesture, witnessing the power of Christ to transform lives and turn our thoughts away from the aims and desires of this world. As men see you day by day, do they think of Christ when they see you? If not, there's something wrong with your spiritual life. When this should be true, then everything would take its right perspective. Israel and the church are alike the objects of God's grace and favor and will share eternal joys together. We of the church have the superiority of being incarnations of God, and we are called upon to be the word made flesh dwelling among men, each in the sphere where God has placed us. Our thoughts are not national, and our aims are not for worldly recognition. We are part of a spiritual body, and our rewards are laid up for us as treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not corrupt, nor thieves break through and steal. All the nation of Israel had the national adoption. Those out of Israel who were also the chosen to salvation had, along with us, the spiritual adoption. Together, we fulfill the functions for which God has saved us, and we shall go on forever to the praise of the glory of his grace. The Lord willing, in our next study, we go on to see the special glory that belongs to the Jews because they were God's chosen people. And our God and Father, we pray thee that the Holy Spirit shall take these truths to our hearts and that thou shalt give us to see the wonders that are ours in Christ. Hear us, we pray thee, in Jesus' name. Amen.